Good morning, good morning. This is me and my wife Jessica today, and we're here and led by the word. We're going to be starting in Judges chapter 14, early 14, and we're going to go through 16 or 17. I can't remember, and honestly, I'm not 100% sure how far I'm going to talk about this. This is an amazing story. We've seen the judges so far, and all the judges have had very similar stories. Me and my army are going to attack. Me and my people are going to work together. I'm going to rule like this, or I'm going to lead like this. Then we come up to, as we know, Samson, a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. I am calling this dude the biblical lone wolf. Like, everything he did was him. Everything he did was by himself. Uh, this this guy just went out and did his thing. Um, I feel, before I get into all the story of Samson, first I want to talk about a couple things. We always talk about Samson and his long hair. Samson had long hair. Everyone says, Samson had long hair. Samson had long hair. Samson took a Nazarite vow. And this vow was abstain from alcohol, avoid becoming unclean by touching a corpse or a grave, and refrain from ever cutting hair. So this is what Nazarites did. Mm -hmm. He wasn't, he's the one guy with long hair that threw a gate. He's one guy with long hair that rope smelled it off of him. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't the one guy in the Bible with long hair. I just want to, you know, touch on that real quick. It's funny how we'll take a Bible story and we'll just pick the one thing we talk about, like, Jonah and the whale, but we don't talk about Jonah and the big old worm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot to this story. So we just kind of want to go through and break it down. What's your favorite part of the story of Samson? Honestly, I reread it this morning. I thought it was really depressing. Like as a child, you know, when you have those Samson stories, it's just, oh, he had long hair and he was super strong. And then Delilah was his undoing. And then he had like kind of a redemption arc. But there was a lot of sadness in this story. This was a man with, and that's that's my topic today. Uh, we can go ahead and just rush to it. This was a man with extreme spiritual presence on his life with extreme flesh weakness. Mm -hmm. And you see, like we talk about Delilah, but this dude had weakness after weakness before yeah. Delilah. Delilah wasn't his only mistake. And, and you know, I, I want to say this. We see great things that he did. Samson was not called. Samson was not anointed. In um, Judges chapter 14, verse 6, it says the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. The spirit of the Lord didn't rush upon Samson for him just to lift a gate. Mm -hmm. Because he was mad because they were fussing at him for what he was doing. That's not what Samson was called for. So we're going to get it through this. Number one, he killed the lion. And when he killed the lion, this is chapter 14, verses 5 through 9. Would you read those? Sure. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath, and behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So the Spirit of God isn't just for him to kill a lion. And I love the story of him killing a lion, but that ain't all it was about. I think God had a deliberate and a purposeful and a huge plan, but weakness got in the way. And this where it's an important thing for us to understand we have also a calling to righteousness. We don't just have one calling and our calling is to do this or our calling is to do this. We, we have to be mindful of outreach and we have to be mindful of righteousness because it's unbelievable. You know, we talk about how sin separates us from God. Sin distracts us from our calling mm, yeah. and sin deliberately leads us away from it. The killing of the 30 Philistines. And the Spirit of the Lord moved mightily upon him. You can read that in Judges chapter 14, verse 19. Read that for us. Okay. I'm sorry, that's a page flip for me. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, and took their spool, and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So then we come down to he... Um, he went and he made his mistake, his weakness of his flesh, and he goes down and he does this. So he gets called out, and he loses this woman. So the woman that he was going back to see, they, um, they married her off to someone else at a party. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, she's for me. And they're like, no, we, we saw you leave. We didn't think you were committed. She's gone. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> Samson gets mad, and he's like, you know what? And here's something I want you to hear. These aren't Israelites. These are Philistines. So what happens is these Philistines, they come from the land of Ch Chur, Churn or something. They come through the Mediterranean. They land on the eastern coast, the western coast of Israel, and they're building up cities on the coast. 
and they're taking over the coast. So he's meeting with his people, he's supping with these people, and he's falling in love with some of the people there. Mm -hmm. So he comes back, he's looking for this woman that he wants to marry with, and they're like, no, she's gone. So he gets angry, and the Spirit of the Lord does not uh, move mightily upon him this time. But Samson goes and catches 300 foxes. I just want, I want that number to set in. Like, I'm guilty of reading things, being like, okay. I was, I was talking to someone at work today. I was like, could you imagine catching 300 foxes? And they said, well, they're probably a lot more common than they are where we live. And I said, okay, I live in Tennessee. Squirrels are everywhere. Could you catch 300 squirrels? Not 30, not 50, not 12, not 70, 300. This guy live catches, not kill and catch. He live catches 300 foxes. Then it goes a step further. I remember Seth, he taught this at Game Changers. And I remember it hit me like, oh my goodness, this is wild. So he has these 300, he divides them by two because he ties their tails together. And when he ties their tails together, he puts um, a torch and he sets it on fire in their tails. So then he takes these foxes and he goes out and he starts throwing them. So he throws some foxes in the wheat fields at harvest time. So they've worked all year for this. Burns down all their harvest fields. He throws some of them in their orchards. Burns down every orchard the Philistines build. He throws some foxes in their vineyards. They had no vineyards left, it said. So out of these 150 duos, he takes out all of their production. So they get mad, obviously. They're like, okay, this dude's got to go. Like, we've got to get rid of this problem. So um, they go out and um, they start burning his family up. And Samson's losing his people. And he's like, oh my goodness. So he goes there and he sees this mess. And we got to understand, this dude is anointed, not a doubt in my mind. And I think, we always talk about his strength, I think he must have been really, really fast to run and catch 300 foxes. So then he runs, runs and he hides in the cleft of a rock. And I forgot the name of the place. And he's hiding out in there and he's depressed and he's battling all these thoughts. I've done this to me. Look at what's going on. And, you know, he's, he's living out here and he's hiding. So they send the Philistines and they said, what we're going to do is we're going to talk him out of this. Like, we're going to talk him down. So they go and they start conversing with him. They're like, listen, we're not going to harm you. <laughs> Total lies. Mm -hmm. We're not going to hurt you. You need to step out of this rock, and we're going to bind you in ropes, and it's going to be fine. So he gives into it, and they set him down. And when he's in his biggest despair, he's facing this horrible turmoil. They're binding him up. And in chapter 15, verses 14 through 17, the Spirit of God moves mightily upon this man so hard that the ropes catch fire. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid, I, I would read it, and I was just like, oh, he, boom, pops through the ropes. No, it says they melt off of him. And if you think of Samson, like think of Samson in your mind and think of the feats he's done so far. He did the killing of the 30 Philistines, he burning of the fields, he slaughtered a bunch of Philistines, and he killed the lion. These stories are getting around. I don't think they were using little twine either. No. In my mind, they got this dude like something you've never seen before. Like you only see a head. There's just so much rope on him. And it melts off. I, I feel God right now. Could you imagine those men seeing this? So I believe they marched out 3,000 men there and they witnessed this. So then everything Samson did up until this point was in his own strength. God has him uh, and shows him there, there's a jawbone of an, uh, an ass laying there. Mm -hmm. So he grabs that. And then he slaughters and kills 1,000 men. I think this was a large turning point for Samson to where God was prodding him and saying, listen, this is no longer just you. I want you to understand this is me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always wondered why the jawbone. I mean, this dude, he's clocking them so hard. His fists are killing them. He didn't need a jawbone. So I, I think God was showing him, like, listen, you have to understand you need me. Hmm. You need me. A donkey is a sy symbol of royalty. A donkey is a symbol of the highest representation of royalty in this land. You need me. And Samson was thinking, I've got anointed. I don't need nothing. Mm -hmm. So then he goes, he kills a thousand. He kills one third of them. And then after this, his, his fist is clenched so hard and he's so tired. No matter how strong and how fast he is, a thousand men is exhausting. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, and then he says, I'm so thirsty. So then God's like, you know what? Let, there's going to be water from a rock. Talk about that a little bit. And then he gives him drink. Um, I think it was actually in the jaw that the water came from. Oh, was it from the jaw? Yeah. Uh, 
chapter 15, verse, if I can read 18. Yeah. He was sore thirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into my hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God clave and hollow place that was in the jaw, and there yes. came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. And he. I'm sorry, that I didn't put that in my notes, but that's what mm-hmm. I was getting at. Uh, God was showing him the anointing was in this. I thought that was so cool that it came out of the jaw, like like you need me. Yeah. And I, I want to. This isn't a discouragement in any way. I want to encourage you. Uh, the Bible tells us uh, we can't do nothing without Christ. Mm-hmm. We really can't. And what we need, he will give us, though. Oh, yeah. So I want you to say, you can't do this without God. If you're feeling like, I've got this. I've got this figured out. I'm doing great. I'm, I've got things under control. I can take on a thousand. You cannot. There is nothing about us that is able to do these things. There's nothing about his vow that makes him special. There's nothing about his arms or his hands that make him special. What's special is the anointing that moves on him. And God... God literally has him fight and then has him so thirsty. And he's trying to show him, like, Samson, listen to me. You mm-hmm. need me. So then we come down to Gaza where he goes He goes to see, I believe it was a prostitute. He gets mad, throws a gate, chapter 16, verse 3. Uh, the escape from the bowstrings. Read chapter 16, verse 9. Oh, are you talking to me? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. It says, Now there were men lying away, abiding with her in the chamber. And she came unto him, and the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he broke the wits as a thread of tow and broken when it touched the fire so his strength was not known so he delilah's trying to trick him and he's like show me your strength show me your strength so he said and i love samson is so full i feel like samson reading this sometimes we're dealing with um if you've ever watched batman or heard of batman the riddler there's so many riddles in this yeah. like he literally does literal literal riddles at the line and now when he's messing with delilah he's like okay here's what you need it's both strings bow strings what it's not bow strings <laughs> and then he said okay but it's this or okay but it's this or okay but it's this and then he finally tells her and what, what is he thinking i, d- I was wondering when he too. tells her yes. and then the next thing he said it's bow strings after he sleeps with her and then she puts bow strings on him then the uh, men come in to kill him then he busts the bow strings and kills the man is he literally thinking i'm going to tell her again And can I tell you what's going on? Sin is so blinding. Mm -hmm. The enemy is, the Bible warns us he is the author of confusion. This man is facing so much confusion and turmoil in his mind. He is so, if I can use the word stupid, he cannot see the facts that are deliberately, not hindsight, the facts that are in front of him. This isn't hindsight. This isn't foresight. This is just current sight. And this man is facing mistake after mistake after mistake. And it becomes, as we know, his undoing. Samson literally dies as a man in prison. Mm-hmm. Samson, not in prison. Samson dies as a prisoner. So we come down. He finally gives in uh, his secret. He does false secret, false secret, false secret. And he tells her the truth. It's in my hair. She cuts his hair. And he comes in. And uh, they parade him in. And you know these people got to be so excited. Like we have caught the Samson. Did you know, if you look into the history, do you know what they called Samson? The fox man. Oh. Because <laughs> I love that. We think of his feet as strength. The, the, they're like, this dude caught 300 foxes. And, you know, it says he burned this vineyard, this orchard, and this wheat. He burned, they estimated, thousands of acres. You think of 150 foxes. That ain't looking out at one field. When he threw out one, they would just run and run and run. He burnt potentially between one and 5,000 acres. Wow. So you think this dude... and. It, He's destroying all of their food. He's destroying, like, in his anointing, he is destroying the enemy. So it comes down to this last thing. They parade him in front of all of the royals. They parade him in front of all the most powerful people. And would you read chapter 16, 28, 29, and 30? Sure. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistine for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with all the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Amen, amen. On. So here, here's some of the uh, few things we can learn from Samson. We are called one. we got to live a holy life. Yeah. 
Um, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, definitely. Uh, we didn't read kind of like the prelude to this, but when the Lord visited Samson's mother, basically, and was like, you, your son is going to need to take a Nazareth vow. You go ahead and don't touch any unclean thing. Don't drink any alcohol, etc. Which I was like, were you doing this before? Yeah, they were. So, you know, prelude to that, there was already all of this that was set before him. I mean, yes, you know, we're definitely called to live a holy life, but you got to think about your decisions, what they're going to mean to other people, especially in this context of what are you going to do that's going to affect the next generation? What's going to affect your kids? By what you ingest spiritually and you're putting out, how is that going to be for the good or be for the bad for this next generation that comes up? That's really, when I read that and yesterday, that, I was like, that's convicting, like, you know. We're going to have to have a podcast called Mama Talk. No. Because that right there, <laughs> that's sorry. Mama Talk. I feel that in my spirit. I, as a parent. I mean, that's intense stuff right there. Yeah. Okay, so one, we're called to live a holy life. Can I get an amen on yeah. that? Like, that's an expectation. This is something so beautiful about our Creator, our God. God uses bad situations. Now, I put bad situations. God uses bad situations created by me to fulfill His purpose. Yes. God can literally take all things and work them together for the good of them that love the Lord. Samson, in all his mistakes, and all his mess, in his blindness where he can't see, he's got no vision, he's got no foresight. This boy comes up and talks to him, brings up his past, and then Samson calls upon God and says, I am willing to die in this if I can take these guys out. In his mistake, God anoints him one last time, and the Spirit of the Lord moves upon this man, and he takes out the leadership. So he took out their food, he took out their army, then he takes out their leadership. In the end, Samson destroyed the Philistines. He destroyed them. Mm -hmm. He did. Like yeah. this dude, he wiped them out. And, and I know we have issues from them. These are the same guys we're going to see fight with some David. But he wiped them out for a long, long time. Um, so another thing that's sad. Samson was not free from the consequences of his own choices. Consequences add up. Our mistakes can catch up with us. But... Um, God's strength is something we need to understand is on each and every one of us. And I'm actually almost to my, my thought. We should let God's strength in our lives and his chosen strength in us use for his work. Mm -hmm. Not for me to throw gates, not for me to have attitudes, not for me to have problems in ministry, not for me to have problems in public. It's for me to do his good work. So we, we hear about this spirit that moves mightily upon him. And I love all the translations of this. It's Some translations say the spirit of God rushed in him. Some of us say, the King James Version says it moved mightily upon him, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, some of us said, and the Spirit hit him. And you know, you, you think of this, this Holy Spirit that's just hitting this dude, the Spirit of God. I'm like, man, this dude had the Spirit of God on him. And then I'm like, no, that's, that's a lie from the enemy of me measuring it like that. The Spirit that's on him is upon me. Amen. And I may not be able to, you know, slay a thousand of the enemy, but God says... Uh, I gave you my spirit nonetheless. So if you read of Samson as a story of old and think, wow, God really did great things then, but you don't understand that there is an actual Holy Spirit inside of you that God wants to use to break down strongholds in people's lives, then we're following the same lie that Samson's following. Mm -hmm. The New Testament, especially Ephesians, there are all these callings on our lives for us to use the spirit. You know, John's, John the Baptist says, it was like fire fall down and it's going to be like the Holy Spirit here and you guys is going to be unbelievable. And this is a story I can tell I'm going to get to experience after the coming of Christ. That Spirit's here now. I don't have to live in that 33-year moment of time where I'm like, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. That Holy Spirit's here right now. Mm -hmm. So we, we read in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Now we have to understand I have responsibility. I have expectation. I have deliberate walk in my life I'm supposed to be doing. God didn't call me, just like he didn't call Samson to throw a gate. God didn't call me to walk with all this power inside me not to share it with somebody. I tried, a um, little pause, slight tangent right here, um, trying to be led by God, and I've been praying. I don't remember if it was Memorial Day or Sunday, I tried to witness to a guy at a store, and Jesse came up at the end and said, what was going on there? That was not going good. And I was trying, and it completely bombarded and failed. And, you know, it was easy for me to just be like, get discouraged or something. It is not about how I feel. 
it's not about me thinking was that successful or that was not it is about me nothing less than trying to be led by the spirit to do what god's calling me to do and we measure success and failure in an instant like well that was a success or that was a failure one god gave him freedom of choice and two we don't know if that will affect him down the road so the enemy's trying i feel like the enemy's trying to lie somebody right now in an outrage sense if it doesn't go good you failed if it doesn't go good, you're not prayed up enough. If it doesn't go good, there's not enough Holy Spirit in you. For one, there's the right amount of faith, the right amount of Holy Spirit, and the right amount of God in you for what you need right now. And that's pretty much all of it. Yeah. So quit measuring things with this idea of success and failure because that's the enemy just trying to deter you from being an outreach of the kingdom. Okay, let's go into this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Spirit's in us. Right now, the same thing that moved mightily upon him, and we find out later down the road this is used. If you look up in King James Version, the Spirit of the, the what is it? Spirit of God moved mightily upon him. Mm -hmm. That happens a few more times. It happens with some kings. We don't have to do that no more. It is in me, living, flowing as rivers of water every day. But the enemy has lied to us so much that we've just bottled it up, and we've literally we've took this spirit and we've dammed it up like the Hoover Dam, and we've held it back. And we're saying, I'm going to put a generator on this and see how I can use this for me. Mm. And God's looking at you and saying, Micah, I told you I gave you this for the kingdom. So we got to understand this isn't for me. This is for the world. Uh, Romans 8, 26. Now, this is a convicting one. And I want to end this one so where we can go home and pray and where we can end this and pray about ourselves. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make us intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There is issues inside of you that you don't know how to deal with. There's issues inside of you that you don't have a 12-step program. There's issues inside of you that you don't know how to fix. I'm going to tell you right now, if you start praying and don't just pray in your mind, you start praying in complete passion out of your heart and start praying in the Spirit, you're going to get some fixing in your infirmities. Amen. Talk to us a little bit about that before we close. I mean, definitely. And I loved what you said about the dam and the generator. I think, you know, there's a scripture, don't quench the spirit. Don't. But how many of us are so guilty of even subconsciously doing that, you know? And we rob ourselves. We rob other people that the Lord wants to use to help. You know, it, it's just, it's a giant mess. If we just surrender, if we live in that fully, then, I mean, who's to say we won't see more miracles, you know? Who's to say? Oh, miracles... God ain't hurting for miracles. God ain't hurting for ability. God, God literally, we, we look up at the sky and they, they launched this new telescope, which I've been following. I think it's the coolest thing. James Webb Telescope, they can see out far and far. God ain't hurting for no ability. Mm -hmm. God knows everything out there by name. And they're, they're saying, I just want to say this little science thing. They, they found a planet far, far, far off. They're like, oh, there's life on this planet. There's life on this planet. But if we send a message there, it'll take us 100 years for us to reach that planet. And if they get the message, it'll take them 100 years to send back if there's life there. God has that planet named. Mm -hmm. God only doesn't have that planet named. He knows the planet that's another trillion light years away named. The issue with miracles is we're damming up the spirit for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the world, you know, I, I've seen some amazing men and women that I believed 100% in prayer. Like they've got this praying for people and there, there's no showing of the ability of God. A lot of us as followers of Christ, we're lacking in faith to believe. Amen. And that, that ain't God's fault. And what it is is we're listening to these lies of the devil of some things or things from the past or God doesn't love us enough. If we can ever capture in our minds how much God loves us, Samson must have knew God loved him. Because mm -hmm. Samson messed up, messed up, messed up, messed up, broke his vow, and then is sitting here in the worst mistake of his life and still crying out to God. I want to tell you, I don't care the dumb mistakes you made. I really don't. you got to understand, like Samson, in your dumb mistakes, still cry out to God. Because that's the one thing, no matter how ridiculous a place you've put yourself in, He will love you. Yeah. Uh, we, we had someone call in there like, listen, I used to love God. I used to worship God. And said, I knew better than I messed up. He could never love me. What? God loved you before. He's going to love you now. And He knows the mistakes. He knows your issues. He literally knows the thoughts in your head. Just, it, this is going to be tough. This is going to be tough, but hear what I'm saying. It is time to get up, say, I'm going to change. I'm going to start seeking after the Holy Spirit. I'm going to start praying for these infirmities. I'm going to start seeking after God. And in the Spirit, I'm going to have some groanings, and I'm going to fix this stuff. I'm, I can't do this by myself, but with God, I can do anything.
Thank you so much for tuning in with us. Oh, we got to talk about Oasis Academy. So, so very, very, very excited about Oasis Academy. We've um, we've grown this. We've worked so hard at this. And Pastor Head of Vision said we need 50 people to stand with us to donate $25 a month because we're wanting to add classes and we're wanting to start sending this to um, uh, Christian rehabs across America to help people in drug addiction, alcohol, all sorts of stuff. And we're looking at even helping uh, where they help veterans in a Christian rehab. We have had 18 people mm-hmm. partner with Oasis Ministry saying, I love what you're doing with Academy. I want to be a part of this. And we've sent all of them a bottle. So I, uh, the, if you haven't got one and you're hearing me talking, say, hey, I haven't got my bottle. They're, they're coming in the mail. They're coming in the mail. These are in four colors. We got this light blue, dark blue, pinkish coral, and green. It, going forward, Pastor said we're going to do this. Every person that becomes a partner and does the $25 a month, um, you get a bottle. So please go to oasisministries.com forward slash knowledge. That's the partnership sign-up page, and it talks a little bit about Academy. Or if you would like to partake and start our online resource of Oasis Academy, oasisministries.com forward slash Academy. Thank you so much. Um, keep praying, seeking God in the Spirit. You can't just pray in your flesh. You got to get past your mind. You got to get in your spirit. You got to just cry out to Him. Be real with Him. God bless you. God bless you.